Hilary Crabb uh, has been our guest now for almost two weeks. He is a psychologist. He's a prolific author. He's written a book called 66 Love Letters, a conversation with God that invites you into his story. A book that um, goes through every book of the Bible, all 66 of them, and sees each letter, uh, book as a love letter from God to, to him and to us. He records in the book um, his struggles with what he reads, uh, his conversation with the Lord as he works his way through these things. And it's been an absolutely fascinating journey. Today, we're taking on, I'm not going to say it's the toughest letter of them all in terms of uh, its message, but it's got to be one of the toughest, if not the mm -hmm. toughest to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, theologians refer to it as apocalyptic literature, which means it's kind of like holding a kaleidoscope up to your eye <laughs> and, and you're seeing all of these, these and it, it's always changing. You, you don't think, see anything specific. Mm. You, what is, what's going on here? Yeah. Everything seems to be an imagery and, and hard to understand symbols and pictures and metaphors and analogies and all of that stuff. When you got there, as I you, was terrified. I was going to say, how did you feel? It would be more than daunting, right? I was not looking forward to it. I thought, I'm not sure what I'm going to get out of this. I've read, I don't know how many textbooks, how many commentaries in the book of Revelation. Yeah. I was raised on prophecy. And charts. And oh my goodness. <laughs> I was, I've seen the charts and I've <laughs> looked at them. And as a kid, I thought, this is absolutely final truth. I've got to learn all this stuff. Nothing matters more. And um, then as years went by, I just got more and more confused. And I thought, I... I want to know what God is saying. The book of Daniel was an apocalyptic book that confused me. And now I've read 65 books and I've written these letters. God, do I have to read Revelation? <laughs> there was, it wasn't all that appealing to start with. No. Um, but I'll tell you, after I spent some time with it, uh, this may be a little of an overstatement, but not much. I think if I had one book to stick with me, if I were put in a prison cell somewhere, uh, it'd be hard choice, but Revelation would be right up there. Really? As a oh, yeah. Why? I think there's one single message that I get out of the book yeah. of Revelation. Things are not as they seem. Yeah. It's just, because think of, think of when he wrote this. John was maybe 86 years old, mm. thereabouts, whatever. Um, and he had uh, pastored with Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his church. I guess they had great Christmas Eve services, I would think, <laughs> back in those days. And, uh, and after being so faithful for all those years as a, as a pastor and as a young guy with Jesus back in his early days, obviously, now he's... Um, Rome declares him an atheist because he wouldn't bow before Domitian, the cruel emperor at the time. Right. And so they banish him as a seditious atheist and put him out in this miserable rock that I've not been to, but you have. And yeah. you have a better feel for it than I have. But here's this old guy just sitting there. And um, as, as we were chatting about a little bit ago, he, he must have said to himself, what's the deal? Yeah, I've been faithful to God. Couldn't I have had a little better pension fund here? Yeah, what kind of retirement plan what is this? What kind of retirement plan is this? Is it not yeah. exactly God loves me? Yeah. And then I think what is happening is John is thinking about, I think it's a letter to the, to, um, it's a letter of a pastor to people who were suffering under Domitian, mm. who was an emperor that was, if not more evil than Nero, he certainly was right up there with them. And they were persecuting the Christians and they were losing their jobs and some were being killed. And John's just hurting for these people. Talk about an other centered guy. He's in, he's in Patmos and he's worshiping on the Lord's day when the visions become. And he starts by saying, you know, I'm your, I'm your, uh, your, your, your companion in suffering, in the kingdom, in endurance. Well, I think I'd rather say to people, I'm your companion in happiness and mm -hmm. blessings and comfort. And John didn't say that at the end of his life. And I'm a Christian now in, in Rome, suffering under the Roman Empire, suffering under Domitian. I get this letter from, from John. I'm not sure what to do with it, it's kind of strange. But I wonder how they read the letter. Yeah. And I think that maybe is the key to it. I think that John is saying, you know, this probably had to be censored by the, I mean, they had, how do you get this letter off the island of Patmos down to the people that he wanted it to be read to? I suppose that had to be carried by somebody. Well, he wrote it to uh, a number of churches. Uh -huh. Seven churches, yeah, right? Seven churches, yeah. Seven churches, exactly, right. Uh, and he kind of analyzed each church in turn, uh, talked about their strengths or weaknesses, where they were falling short. Mostly weaknesses. Mostly weaknesses. The only one that doesn't seem to have any weaknesses is Philadelphia. Philadelphia, right, the littlest church perhaps. The, li <laughs> the weakest, littlest church. Weakest, littlest, maybe the newest. Yeah. Uh, was it uh, the Ephesian church that uh, had lost their first love? Yeah. Yeah, th that's, that's, a, that's a gripping concept. I mean, anybody who has been in love can relate to a greater or lesser degree to the fact that love needs to be cultivated or it can diminish. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and that the Lord should be so concerned yeah. 
about uh, requited love. Yeah, yeah. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yeah. And I've raised my children well, and you turn out like this. Yeah. I sow grapes, and up comes what? Yeah. You know, wild grapes. Yeah. I have loved you. And here John gets this incredible image of the Lord. And you look at this image that he gets, who stands in the middle of the seven churches, and he's got this, this white hair, speaking of the Ancient of Days from Daniel. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth, and I'm told the sword is two words for sword in the Greek. One is a long saber. This is a, a short little thing for up close combat. Mm. And his eyes are piercing. And I'm thinking, I, I want to cuddle up with him. He's my lover. He's my bridegroom, and I want to be his bride and, you know, snuggle up with him. And what I, what I believe is happening here is we are seeing, and this is a rather radical sentence, I'm not sure if I'm going to go to the cross for this one, but we, we, so, so often in our Christian culture, we think of Jesus the way he's revealed in the Gospels. Well, he's the same yesterday, today, forever. I understand that. But he shows a different side of who he is in the book of Revelation, and that's who he is today. Hmm. We're seeing Jesus in Revelation 1, the way He is today, um, a God, the God, who is saying, I see through everything. I'm holding the seven stars. I'm in charge of the universe. I'm in charge of this whole deal. And, and my voice is like the sound of rushing waters. When you hear my voice, every other noise will be blocked out. When you stand by Niagara Falls, you don't hear much else except those, those falls. And what I'm telling you, John, is this is who I am. And John falls on his face and says, I can't handle this. And then Jesus says, no, I want you to stand up because I know what I'm doing and you're part of the plan. I want you to write letters to these seven churches. And I'm standing in the middle of them. And then he says to Ephesus, as you said, you've lost your first love. You know, Lewis talks about uh, his, his kids on our honeymoon. It's kind of like a little boy or a little girl splashing in a wading pool. But if an adult is splashing in a wading pool, something's wrong. Mm. I've got to learn how to, how to swim, how to dive. That's real love. Yeah. And as time goes on, I get saved and I'm all excited about Jesus. But as time goes on, that love has to mature. That love has to be, Lord, you're worth any price to know. It's not just the good times every day, but I'll pay any price to know you better and advance your plan. That's what he's saying to Ephesus. You've lost that. When Paul, when Paul or uh, John, when John starts out with the letter, as I recall, he refers to it as a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. And I, I think it, you, that might be taken two ways, a revelation from Jesus Christ, mm. but also a revelation of Jesus and Christ. That's like the of part there too. Yeah, and I, that's the thing that has stuck with me. I, I, as I have been, had my eyes glaze over at all of the, the kaleidoscopic imagery. Sure and, 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 and Yeah, I, I keep looking for Jesus, you know, and boy, he's everywhere. Yeah, all through the book. All but it, the but book. It's, it's a fascinating revelation of Jesus because it's not like the Gospels. No, it seems very different. Yeah. It, it, it's, or it's, this nice guy yeah. who's hanging out with his disciples, healing some people. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, the Gospels gave us Jesus from this side. Revelation gives us Jesus from the other side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it really is fascinating. It really is. Um, w what did you do as you were going through this when you came to passages that were just impossible to uh, understand? Well, I acknowledged my humanity. My humility was strengthened. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized there are some things that will be forever beyond me. But I kept on saying, but Lord, you, you've written this to me. As you've written it to every, every Christian can say the same thing. Every person can say you've written this to me. And, and I want to know what you're saying to me at my level of immaturity. I don't know you all that well, Lord, but here's where I am. What are you saying to me? And, um, and I got out of it a lot of things. I think I might have mentioned earlier one in one of our earlier conversations that one of the things I got out of it was that there, there is a throne in this chaotic world. I mean, what's happening with nations that are terrorist attacks and, and rogue nations and all sorts of things? And part of me says, can't we get some strong government in Canada and the U.S. and other free nations to take on the world and get back world peace and all the rest of it? What's happening? It's chaos. And the Revelation says to me, there's a throne and someone's on it. Yeah. The throne is occupied and he knows what he's doing. And so therefore, if the wrong person becomes my president or the right person becomes my president, from my perspective, that matters, but not ultimately. Yeah. What matters ultimately is the right person is on the throne and he's going to take on evil. And the more that the kingdom of God advances, the more the kingdom of the devil rebels. And therefore the collision gets stronger and stronger as time goes on. And then God finally decides it's time. And I see Jesus waiting in the wings, if you will, in Revelation 5. Is it time yet, Father? Yeah. And the Father at some point says, yeah. 
And then Jesus says, I'm taking on Satan. I'm going to win this thing once and for all. And my people are going to be the holy people of God. Jerusalem's going to come down and make this world into everything I dreamed it to be. And my people are going to be happy forever. This is the book, 66 Love Letters, a conversation with God that invites you into his story, a book that Dr. Crabb will tell you is designed with one purpose in mind, and that is to get you into the book, into the Word of God for yourself. And we really want you to uh, have the book. We'll be back with Dr. Crabb later in the hour.